um, so many amazing uh, new releases to show, show you. And in particular, this gorgeous book that we're gonna be talking about today. So, so come on by. Or if you can't make it in, come by our website. All right, I think we are uh, doing well here. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. My name is Brandy and I'm a bookseller in the children and teens department of politics and prose. Thank you for turning into our virtual event where we continue to bring authors and new books to you in the comfort of your own home. Today, author illustrator Kate Samworth will discuss her new picture book, Grand Isle with author journalist Lulu Miller. Kate Samworth's art is inspired by natural science and art history. It responds to the constant changes in nature and draws on her experiences farming in Turkey and Spain and hiking in Brazil. Her books include the Kirkus Prize winning Aviary Wonders Inc. and Liza Jane and the Dragon. Her work is held in multiple public and private collections across the U.S. and abroad, and her illustrations have been featured in World Watch and Orion magazines. And Kate will be in conversation today with Lulu Miller. And Lulu Miller is a science journalist. She's the co-host of Radio Lab. Uh, she also makes stories for NPR's Invisibilia and The New Yorker and beyond. And she also is the author of Why Fish Don't Exist. So for today's event, you can ask the authors a question by clicking on Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can also vote on your favorite questions by clicking the thumbs up button to push them up in the queue. We can also, you can also click on the chat to purchase your own copy of Grand Isle. And we do have signed copies available while supplies, supplies last. So go ahead and get your copy now. All right, I am so happy to turn this over now to Kate and Lulu, over to you. Great, well, thank you for that, Brandy. Um, thank you again for everyone who's just hanging out with us in the strange but increasingly familiar space that is the virtual space. Um, politics and prose is such a special place if there is anyone here who's never been. When you're in DC, I highly recommend you check it out. It is really a world. Um, into itself. And um, it is my great pleasure to be here with Kate, who um, indeed is a, an amazing illustrator and also lent, lent her talents to my adult book, um, where she did one illustration for each chapter. And repeatedly, that is one of the, the favorite comments I get about the book. The words are fine, but you know, the, the illustrations really brought something special. Um, and so I have a lot of questions for Kate, but I want to just do another uh, one more quick little preamble. Before, well, but you can say hi. You, we haven't even let you speak. <laughs> I was enjoying the um, relaxing spot back here. Okay, okay. <laughs> you keep you stay right there a little longer. Um, but yeah, I mean, you have you have such a captivating biography. Um, I feel very lucky to have known you first as a friend, and then as this artist who I really admire. And um, I just wanted to share a little bit about that to kick this off. So you know, you have all these incredible publications, your, your work is, your artwork is in museums. Um, but I'll know, also know a little bit about your trajectory sort of as this like brief punk star, then you had a whole life in New Orleans, you were a farmer and a hiker, um, but a classically trained painter and a teacher. And in terms of the mediums that you work in, um, I mean, over the years I've met you, I'm just, you, you show me what's going on in the back room. You're working in oils, you're working in watercolors, you're working in these fantastic scratch boards, which look like these kind of ancient medieval fairy book things. You work in, I've seen you do claymation. Um, I'm sure I'm missing a million things. Um, I've seen you do dioramas. You suddenly got into dioramas um, and, and you have like one of the most authentically hungry minds and hands you seem to always be making um, and always stretching yourself. Um, and it's so beautiful to watch. And I remember the first time I met you, I met you through a friend and you, we were both living in Virginia and you were up living in this really magical little place on a mountaintop that was kind of surrounded by flowers and sunsets and clouds and copperheads and rattlesnakes. <laughs> you were always, you know, like getting out with shovels and there were goats and, and you meant, and you had this whole career of different things. And you mentioned that 
you, you were working on this little project. You had become really fascinated with birds and, and you took us into this little like back room, this tiny, and there were these massive paintings of birds, but their beaks were sort of had quilted patterns and they were this like very interesting in-between space of, I guess, almost surrealism. I don't know, you'd probably have a word for it. And you kind of offhandedly said, I'm thinking of maybe trying to turn this into a children's book. Um, and then a couple of years later that became Aviary Wonders Inc., um, which is this like post-apocalyptic, wonderful, beautiful feast for the eyes about a land in which birds have gone extinct. So you need to, children need to order birds from a catalog and that won the Kirkus Prize, you know, you're, you're first dabbling in this form of children's books and you blew up the world. Um, and so I guess with this whole kind of journey in mind, I know you've, I know you've done illustration for other people, myself included, for the Eliza Jane and the Dragon, for magazines, you've done all this illustration. And then here we are today to celebrate Grand Isle, uh, which unlike Aviary Wonders, Inc., and unlike the books you were illustrating for, is entirely wordless. Um, and so I've got a question. My first question to kick it off, I want to ask you. But first, I'd like, if it's possible, can we kind of let people see in the audience what this one looks like? Can you yes. show us a bit about the world of it? Yes. So I'll give you a quick little peek so that you have some sense of what we're talking about here. This is the almost completed, all the images are there, but you'll notice the title page in the real book has the text. Oopsie. Oh yeah, that's great, that's good. So I don't know how much more you need to see here, but I, I think, think you should, I think you should keep going a little more. I don't want you to give away any spoilers, but maybe go to the ocean a little, a little more. Okay. Yeah. Maybe stop there. Okay. I'll, I'll hint that it's after this thing start to really turn. Um, yeah, and so my my first, I mean, this just, I think that just needs a clap. This is such an exquisite, the narrative that you create ends up being, I mean, I'm not kidding you. I knocked my fist on the <laughs> table when like there's a little plot twist. And it was so interesting to have that effect from a totally wordless book, but there's a powerful narrative in there, um, a muscular narrative, like it, it's great. Um, but the world, it's so exquisite. It is such a triumph. Um, and I guess I wonder, how did you, what was the genesis of the idea? Um, where did it come from? And do images come first? Does plot come first? Can you just walk us through the genesis for the idea? Yeah, actually I pulled out some of these old drawings. Huh? Can you all see this? Maybe come a little closer. Okay, yeah. So it came from a few different things. Um, when I'm trying to work out a story idea, I really like to do as many super detailed drawings as possible because I need to spend time in the world to figure out what the story is and with the characters. And so I had bought this, um, I bought this ostrich egg 
at Union Square in New York. I dropped off the <laughs> art for Aviary Wonders. Yeah. And the publishers was right across from Union Square and they had the farmer's market. So I found this giant ostrich egg and I bought it as a gift to com commemorate that day of turning in the art for my first book. Wow. And it's Wait, this sorry, sorry follow up. With an egg inside. With an egg you could have It was eaten. hollowed out already. It was hollowed. Okay. Yeah. Um and it was really beautiful. It was it had been hollowed out but it still weighs a couple of pounds. The shell is like an eighth of an inch thick or maybe even more. Wow. Um and so I really was in love with this humongous egg and I was thinking about what my next story would be. And I knew I wanted it to be like some magical worlds that the girls would find. And so it started off with like, what if they came across? Well, I think actually the first idea was that they'd be walking down the beach and find a boat. So I have that drawing somewhere. Um, and I wanted them to row out to somewhere. I'm not quite sure where, but I wanted them to walk down the beach and find some boat that would take them to a mysterious land. And then I thought, what if they go to these rocks that look like eggs? And if they turned out to be eggs, what would happen? So I wanted them to travel in the egg. And, um, and so then I created just these images oh. as I tried to figure out where they could go. And I liked the idea of like, if the egg is huge, what else is huge? I guess mm. the feathers would have to be enormous and everything. And, um, and I knew that they needed to have some kind of trouble along the way. So the <laughs> egg gets bounced along. <laughs> um, so it took, a, it took ages and ages to figure out what the story was. And I just tried it a million different ways. I had also been reading a lot about natural history explorers because I was studying printmaking before I started working on this and I was reading about all the collectors and illustrators that were traveling you know before even airplanes so they'd spend months on a ship to get to a faraway land sometimes looking to pillage and take resources steal slaves etc like it's not a beautiful history all the time sometimes they're going to these places out of sheer curiosity about the world and sometimes they're you know working for European colonial expansion. So it's a mixed bag. But I was reading about Alfred Wallace in particular, who had gone down the Amazon and I had been to Brazil. So I was especially interested in his story. And he's collecting all these specimen and doing all these drawings and making all these notes. And then he's trying to get them back by boat. And this was a common method of exploring and gathering and transporting um, materials mostly back to Europe. And a lot of his collection got lost at sea. And that was a common experience for these collections and notes and drawings to get lost or damaged by the, um, damaged by moisture. You know, his, a lot of his materials got damaged over time through moisture. Um, in some cases like von Humboldt and others were sending specimens back in jars of rum yeah. on ships that were headed back from Europe while they continued exploring. And then the sailors would drink the rum, which is pretty disgusting and hilarious. And then the about. specimen would be like ruined. Yeah, the specimen would be ruined and <laughs> uh, quite a cocktail. Um, so I'm sorry, what was the question? <laughs> oh no, well, just the genesis. So you were you were kind of like, you, you'd seen the ostrich egg, you were thinking about people like Alfred Wallace who are sending, who are collecting and spent and sending things back from that's oh, right. And then do they just kind of collide in like giant egg, aquatic? <laughs> yes, finding all these magical new specimens. Um, I was definitely thinking about not just Roald Dahl's universes that he creates in his uh, books, but also the movie Willy Wonka. I can still watch that um, twice a year and love it. So I really <laughs> wanted it to have that Willy Wonka feeling of like slightly ominous, psychedelic, Ooh. colorful. Yeah. Um, so I was definitely channeling Roald Dahl as much as Alfred Wallace. And I have to thank Marsha Leonard, my editor, who really helped me, um, who really helped me with the shaping of the story, so. Yeah, that's so interesting you bring up Willy Wonka because one of my questions, I mean, that, that it's a perfect word. I mean, it's psychedelic and it's one of my questions was, you know, is this world foreboding or is it, or is it, wondrous you know and 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 it's hard to 
I mean, it's hard to know. And it, I, well, I, I would ask you that question and I bet you'll immediately say that's a false dichotomy. It doesn't have to be one or the other, but um, I mean, when you're, when you're diving into the world that you're making, you're both exploring it and making it. And I guess um, two questions here. I mean, one, you said, as you're tinkering around with the story, like when you went to sit down and start on those black and white sketches, do you get an image and then you want to render it? Or does the drawing itself make you begin exploring the world? Um, and then how does that then relate to the story? Like, what is your process on that end? Um, usually I spend months working on these really detailed drawings because I have to believe in the place in order to figure out what the story is. So I usually spend months putting the characters in every possible setting to see what they're capable of and find out what they're interested in. Um, and then I'll start to get ideas about what the narrative arc is. The more I see them entering these different landscapes and reacting, the more I can figure out what, what they would do and what their story is. Um, when I was first working on this book, it was like, uh, let's see. I think I started working on this in like 2014 or 2015. And I'm really interested, or before Trump became president, I was tending to tell darker stories. And then my response to the last, not Biden's winning, but to Trump winning was that I didn't want to put any more darkness in the world. So I really, this story had already been written and the narrative had been formed, but the, the artwork was just done in pencils. Um, so my sentiment writing it was a little bit different. After, um, after Trump became president, I really wanted to put light and optimism into the world. And so when it came time to finish the book in color, I tried to really erase as much darkness as I could and make it even more colorful. And, uh, and so it changed the tone, I think, of the story because I felt like all right, the world's already scary enough for kids as it is. So I want to give them some true escape and for adults too. I just wanted it to be like fun and colorful and be sort of an antidote to the vision that I had when I wrote Aviary Wonders. And yet even you trying for life, I mean, <laughs> a lot of the plants have fangs and appear to be meat eating and are bigger than the children. Yeah. And a lot of the birds <laughs> have talents and there's a new, couple of near death moments. So like, I guess I, I love that, 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 that you made that intentional choice. Like it is so bright. It's like magenta and sherbet orange. And, um, but you can't, it seems like you can't get away from darkness. And I want I feel and like it has to have some elements of like human, there's like human heads that look like berries hanging down. I like that sense of recognizing human forms and giving it a little bit of fear but they make it out fine and I want it to be a little bit more of a you know I want some suspense in there and they're gonna be okay <laughs> it is Maybe. a dog eat dog world <laughs> <laughs> um and and what about the decision to make it wordless um how did you come to that was that a hard sell and and what effect do you think it has on the the, the reader the viewer a few different things. Um, I'm an aspiring writer, but I just haven't put in the time to be good at it. So I've gone through fits and starts of taking lots of writing classes and getting absorbed in it for a couple months. But ultimately, I just haven't put in the hours to be a good writer. And so I felt like any text that I was adding to this story was taking away from it. Um, mm -hmm. It just felt like I was repeating what was already there. Um, and so it was sort of a practical decision. And then part of it is like, I wanted it to feel like a movie, like a silent movie. And so I felt like it didn't really need the text uh, because all the information is there. And like, I love wordless picture books, starting with Lind Ward and, you know, David Wiesner, Wiesner is of course a master. Um, Sean Tan's The Arrival had a huge impact on me when I first saw that many years ago. So there is this um, sort of cinematic quality to word, wordless picture books that I was interested in. As a, as a um, person who likes sound, you know, I work in radio and I think sound is so evocative. 
one of the effects I noticed when I read this, and even when you were just kind of sliding through right there at a pace that was actually faster than I read it, but is like you, because there aren't the words, there's this expansive effect where you, I, I mean, they literally, <laughs> they sound like, like these pictures you, because there aren't words, you just, your eye starts looking around and then I swear it activates your ears and like you hear the waves, you hear some distinct gulls. You can even hear, you know, I'm looking at this, this picture, um, you know, and like, you can hear the, the sound of the sand and the, the, the one kid's hands padding into the sand and then the scraping of that big sort of acorny pine cone thing. And, and, and they, they really are, um, I don't know, it just is such a, it's such a proof of concept that when you kind of take away the sort of didactic, the words telling you not just what the people are saying, but what to notice, mm. it then like allows this truly more immersive experience. And then in something as fantastical as this, like it, it really feels like a gift. It feels like a place you can immerse into. And I just, I don't know. I love, I love the effect. Um, I want to remind people that we, I think we have one question in there, please throw questions. Kate, one of my favorite things is just like talking with you late into the night. So like ask Kate anything, you can ask me anything, throw your questions in the Q and A there. We'll, we'll get to them soon. Um, I wonder if you have a favorite page in here or is that like asking about a uh, favorite? No, I, def <laughs> I have several least favorites and one favorite. <laughs> okay, tell us the favorite. Um, the favorite is the point where the story turns but I'll show you anyway, because. Is it the wave? It's the no. girls being tossed out of the boat. Yes, that's such, okay. You pull it up, I'll pull it up in hard. You, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my favorite page, but I think partly it's the colors and I don't know why that's my favorite. I love it. I mean, it endures, there's so much movement in it um was that a okay so to get to a favorite does that come quickly or is that one that took many drafts that took to get to? many many I probably did that page 15 or 20 times because the medium is like you got to get the transparencies just right yeah that that I did many many times there's no there's no real fixing the water in that color. Whereas the plants are opaque, they can be painted over, but working in those transparencies took a million tries. And it took me the longest to, excuse me, to figure out how to do the water mm -hmm. and how to make it consistent with the rest of the style. Cause I don't really paint water. So that was my first time trying to paint water. How, what did you mm -hmm. land? Was there a trick or technique or a particular breakthrough? I, I, well, first I was really studying tons of different approaches to painting water and Winslow Homer is a master and I looked at tons and tons of his incredible um, oil, I'm sorry, watercolor paintings, especially of the water. I looked at a lot of Hokusai, the Japanese woodcut artist. You feel that. I would, I, I would, I, you feel that in that one. I really look. Gorgeously. Looked, yeah. Well, I looked carefully at Hokusai and I tried like copying his droplets just to understand how he did it. And then I rode a ferry from, um, from Lewis, um, Delaware over to Cape May in New Jersey. And I was on the ferry and I was just watching the water. I spent the whole trip really trying to understand what water looks like when it's oh, splashing. Yeah. And I couldn't believe how perfectly Hokusai captured the shape of the droplets and the and the water in motion. It's really sublime to think he can do that with a hard line to take a transparent amorphous, yeah. Um, uh, shape and do it with hard lines of a woodcut is phenomenal. So those were the two people I really studied. Do you take pictures or films like on that ferry ride? Are you also taking pictures or you're just looking? I, I took a lot of pictures, but they ended up being pretty useless because <laughs> the situation is so different, you know? Yeah. It's like, if you want it backlit, then you got to get back to the photos. Right. So really, it was more helpful to look at how other artists do it. I'm just looking when you said it, like it's surprise again, like just to that it's surprising how it moves and it, it's almost more like clouds here. Um, okay. And then what about, it doesn't have to be your least favorite page, but what page caused you the most <laughs> agony? What was like the hardest one to get out and into the world? 
Absolutely. Drawing kids was my biggest struggle because I've probably spent about three to five hours in my life drawing kids. And you might have noticed earlier when I was showing these sketches, these are very much adults. Hmm. Um, and the proportions of hmm. kids are so different from adults. And I, you know, I'm very critical of my own work and I kind of cringe when I look at the kids' proportions in this book. Um, it's funny also to look at Renaissance paintings of cherubs and you see these little old men with like <laughs> these they, wings are they, and these Are they modeled men. after men? Well, they're supposed to be kids, but people weren't drawing those from observation at that point. Yeah. So, and you realize when you try to do it how hard it is. And that's why so many of those late medieval, early Renaissance cherubs look like <laughs> old men with these <laughs> weird bodies so I will no longer well, you're carrying smirk. the tradition forward yeah no. absolutely I thought they looked very very they looked like normal kids to me you pulled okay. one off then you're used to abnormal kids um for now I'll, I'll end with this one and, and then we'll turn to some of the questions piling up but um okay so in 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 Eliza Jane and the Dragon you which was another book you did um you walked me through kind of all these secret little cookies like this was your favorite band and this is your niece's what are there any cookies in this book people can look out for oh okay so Lulu's referring to this book that I illustrated for an author named Laura Lippman who is a, a crime fiction writer for adults normally and wrote a children's book and so I put references in the flyers to different bands that I loved in New Orleans and to my <laughs> nieces and nephews and um and some of my favorite paintings are hanging in their living room. Um, no, there's not really any personal images like that in here. It was a very different experience. I guess just making up the plants is where I got really lost yeah. in this book was just having fun inventing all these plants. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, well, I will, I'll turn us for, for a little bit to the Q&A and then I may come back um, to a few more. Great. Thank you both so much. That was such an interesting conversation. And Kate, thank you for sharing your creative process with us. And you answered so many questions that I didn't know that I had. Um, but I will turn now to some questions from our guests. And I just want to point out one of the questions was about um, the recording that will be available on YouTube. So if you're looking for that, just look in the question and answer box because we posted uh, the YouTube, li YouTube link where that will be after we finish up today. So please do share this, especially with educators who may be able to use this in the classroom. Um, we, we love for you to, to share these resources. Um, Dorna would like to know, Kate, uh, can you discuss the ways you break up the frame of the page um, create panels and multiple other frames in connection with your choice to make a wordless book. Um, and also whether you were thinking of other inspiration like graphic artists, you kind of got into this right at the end um, or old triptychs. So if there's anything else you didn't mention uh, in that. Um, is that Dorna Kazani by any chance? It is. And oh, hi Dorna, I can't see you. She so can't wait for her book. <laughs> That's a dear old friend of mine that I haven't seen in many years. It's nice to know you're out there. Um, so the panels really came to how much time does each movement in the book deserve? And so there's spaces, you know, you have a set amount of pages in a children's book. It, it's usually 32 pages or it's in multiples of eight. So you've got to figure out how many pages you have to tell your story and that determines how long you can linger over each movement. And there's times when the kids are doing things where I don't want it to be a full, it's not worth um, a full page because you, you might lose the reader's interest. So you want to condense those motions where I need to show them, for example, getting into that pod. I can't just have them looking at the pod on one page and sitting in it in the next. So it needs some transition, but you want to move the action along. Um, quickly enough to keep the viewer turning the pages. And I forget what the second part of the question was. Oh, graphic artists or something. Um, mm -hmm. Sean Tan is one of my all time favorite illustrators. Um, he started out as an aspiring science fiction writer and he was doing these elaborate drawings to put with his writing submissions. And the publishers loved his art 
more than his writing. So he became an illustrator um, almost accidentally. He's absolutely one of my favorites. Um, David Wiesner is, of course, a master storyteller and does amazing wordless picture books. Aaron Becker's Journey is a beautiful book. Um, Harold and the Purple Crayon I read as a, as a kid. That's almost wordless and that I read again and again and again, and it's still worth reading. Um, Robert Ingpen, I wish I could be as good as Robert Ingpen. He's one of my favorite illustrators of all time. Um, I love Carson Ellis. I love John Klassen's, um, I don't know, Blex Bolex, a French um, uh, illustrator does beautiful, weird work. I don't know, there's tons, that's a few. Thank you, yes, yeah, so many good ones. Um, do you have uh, uh, any advice for parents who want to encourage, this is from Daisy, uh, advice for parents who want to encourage their child's sense of wonder? Yes, I mean, honestly, just getting outside. I saw a um, hummingbird moth um, this weekend. I went to the Patuxent Research Center. If you're here in Maryland, you can go out to the Patuxent Research Center. And so, you know, looking at insects, you will still, even though, you know, we're all concerned about the health of the insect population, there's so much to be discovered. So I would say spend more time outside looking closely and sitting quietly and waiting. And Lulu is also an expert in finding the sense of wonder. I turned to Kate's work. Um, but yeah, I think I, lo I love that. Yeah, getting outside and not bringing or not allowing yourself once you feel a question, don't Google it and yeah. don't look at your phone and, and kind of like work through the questions and start to come up with theories and then, and give yourself time to not know. And then when you finally go check it out, there's like almost this like ravenousness and this gratitude, someone studied it. And so I like to try to like, yeah, look, wonder, ask questions and, and delay the, the answering a little bit so that I can, I can have more questions in my head. We've seen so much wonder this summer in the DC area because we had our um, <laughs> cicadas uh, that really, um, I, I think just kids found them so fascinating. And we had so many kids coming into the store wanting to learn more. So it really, it really ignited an, an interest, I think, in insects in some of these kids to learn more. That's great. Uh, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> Uh, kind of a follow-up question, Katie, Kate, um, when, what recommendations do you have for parents um, approaching a wordless picture book with their child and how, how maybe to, to go, go about going through the story with them? I think it's exciting to let the kids tell you what's happening. There's a temptation, I think, as adults to want to do the explaining, but I think it's really fun to see what kids think is happening because they'll have some really cool ideas. So. I love, I love that thought. And we, Kate and I were thinking it could be a fun prompt even to like look at a picture and then everyone kind of go away and, and write down what they see, what they hear, what's being said, and then come compare that and just look at all the different worlds we see within a world. Um, For example, somebody, a couple people now have, have said that the kids are getting smaller and it never occurred to me in this whole process, which has been going on since like 2015, that the kids were getting smaller. <laughs> I had imagined the giant seed pod, like I see them walking down the beach and larger and larger things are washing up on shore from this huge island. And then they travel to an island where everything is enormous. Um, but a couple people now have commented that the kids are getting smaller. So I think it's really interesting to <laughs> let everybody state their own interpretation. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Um, and then um, Daisy also had a follow-up question. Is Are there any projects that you are working on right now that we can know about? Yeah, um, I'd love to share them with you. I've been doing this series that's very much, um, I imagine it as like a modern fairy tale where some girl that's probably me has some like some magical powers that she doesn't have complete control over. And she's living on the edge of some sort of abandoned, maybe fracking town or some, she's living on the edge of the woods and there's all these human structures and tools available. And um, of course, I would love it if Lulu would write a story for me. <laughs> um, I've been collaborating with a few different authors where some people will look at a piece and write a short 
um, story or a poem or something. A wonderful writer named Rachel Klein has written a piece for me. So I'll show you a couple of those images. They are, um, they're amazing. Watch out. <laughs> uh, let's see. So like I said, it takes me ages to, um, to come up with a story idea. So I've just been spending a lot of time doing these drawings and trying to see if a narrative develops out of it. And we'll see. So far, there's not a clear um, story arc, but I know what this character is interested in what she's doing. And um, maybe eventually a story will emerge. Oh, you know, Kate, story. they're not showing up on our screen. Oh, shoot. Let me try again. Oh, now they should. Let's see. Yeah, there we go. So if people are in the mood, you can look at my website and you'll see these images. And if you feel like writing something for it, you can just email me. You see my contact info there. And it's really fun to see what people come up with. So I love that idea. What was the medium for that, Kate? This is scratch board. So it's, um, it's a board that's covered in a fine white clay and then coated in black ink. And you can remove the ink with anything sharp. At the moment, I like an X-Acto knife best. Um, for Lulu's book, I used this medium and I was using mostly an upholstery needle. Uh, but really anything sharp will scratch that ink away. Wow. It'll reveal the white line. It's, it's gorgeous. Thanks. I had studied printmaking and this technique was um, invented to replace relief printmaking and used in journals. So photography had been invented, but cameras were too heavy and bulky to move out onto the street to take photos. Um, and so instead of going through the extreme amount of work needed to create a relief matrix, um, they had the artist just doing these drawings that could be photographed and looked like relief prints and then printed in newspapers and journals. Okay, very cool. And you might've mentioned this, um, but if you can say again, because I had a question, what the medium for Grand Isle, what was the medium? That was a combination of acrylic inks, which are similar to watercolors, but because of that acrylic binder, they, they don't stain and move around like watercolors do. And then um, opaque gouache on top. Nice. We have a question from another amazing illustrator, Gareth Hines. Hi, Gareth. Um, <laughs> who um, says, going back to a theme Lulu talked about early on, you do so many different things artistically. Can you describe your general approach to being an artist and talk about how you balance personal and professional work or fine art and illustration work or just different kinds of projects? Yeah, let's see. Um, I studied oil painting from observation and I studied figure drawing and I think those are really crucial tools for illustrators. I know Gareth is an incredible artist and I know he has a background similar to mine in studying observational painting. Um, I choose the medium that I think best suits the story. So for me, this modern fairy tale series, I want it to look like old illustrations. I want it to look like old etchings and traditional um, illustrated books. So that's why I'm working in that medium. Grand Isle needed to be bright. And I did aviary wonders in oil painting, but by the time they get um, photographed and reproduced, you can't really tell their oils. So it's more practical to work in an acrylic medium or a water-based medium. So, you know, when I'm stuck in one certain medium and I feel like I don't have any ideas, then I might just do the same image in black and white that I had done in color or vice versa. Um, I like to switch media and I really love drawing. I love the meditative quality of scratching away the um, ink off the scratch board. And as far as the balance of like illustrating and professional versus personal work. Mm, that's a hard one. I'm really grateful that I'm doing a lot of online teaching now. Um, I really love teaching because working in the studio is very lonely and it's really nice to sh also share the skills that I think are really important with younger people that are getting ready to enter the market. So fortunately, the pandemic has given me a lot of teaching opportunities. Now I'm teaching um, all year through the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Art, 
I used to just teach on weekends or a week here and there. And uh, hopefully through the New Orleans Academy, I was supposed to teach there and then Ida knocked out the power. So we'll see what happens. But um, I don't know, I think for all of us artists or creative types, it's a constant, like you're happy to have the time to work on your own projects, but then you need the income from other things. So I don't have an answer quite yet. <laughs> Can you, can you talk in our kind of remaining moments here, like, can you talk a little bit about this class that you're teaching that feels like a lot of your career has been building toward, which I think, is it called the history of natural history illustration? Uh, I keep changing the title because it's really <laughs> cumbersome, but I'm teaching an art history and art projects class that's about the uh, history of the illustration of natural history. Okay. Um, natural history actually means natural research. Historia comes from the Greek word meaning research. So natural history sounds confusing, but really it's about all of the art that people have made as they look at nature and try to categorize and understand nature. So I start with the ancient Greeks and then work my way through um, late 18th century early, early 19th century. By then the art has evolved so much, sciences are pretty well developed by then. So I'm teaching about all the explorers and collectors and illustrators and anatomists and all the weird theories that were um, held onto for centuries. It's been a passion of mine for a couple decades now, I guess. And, um, and so I'm excited to be teaching about it. Are there any like bizarre techniques in particular that jump out at, at you as you've have you kind of gone down that rabbit hole? Like, well, yeah. there was a very interesting anatomist in 16th century Holland that was um, studying human anatomy and then saving different human body parts and making dioramas with like seashells combined with human tendons and bones and so forth. And then his daughter would, he put these dioramas in glass jars and then his daughter would make these elaborate lace things to put on the top of the jar and then glue all these beautiful seashells together. So there's a lot of strange art out there. Yeah. And a lot of artists were studying anatomy firsthand and actually performing the dissections themselves to understand nature. And sometimes scientists had to learn how to draw to record their studies. So there's a lot of very beautiful and interesting um, observational studies that came from necessity. That sounds so interesting. I wanna just dig a little deeper. I wish we had more time. Um, I, I see that uh, Marianne had mentioned a request. Um, you had mentioned so many wonderful wordless books and artists. Um, I, I don't know for sure if this is possible, um, but it, it, if we could get a maybe just a, a list that we could share with some of the folks who participated today so that they can explore a little further. Mm -hmm. Is that something we could do? Yeah, sure. What do you mean? Like type it right now or? Um, no, not right now, but just after the fact, if maybe just a couple of the authors you mentioned sure. share it with us and we can, um, I, I'll try to find a way that we can get that information out to some of our viewers. That would be, sure. that would be really nice for them. Kate, I've got another question about, you kind of mentioned in your trajectory from turning away, not, you know, adding in all this color after the Trump election and feeling like you didn't want to add darkness, you wanted to add light. I, you know, I, as your friend, I watched this moment for you artistically, like it, it, it felt like after the election, you just, you put away all your paintbrushes and, and there was really a moment where it seemed like you question the point of making art in the face of of so many other things needed to be done in the world yeah um and I guess I wonder I saw little blips of it from far away I saw you make this like a resistance film out of claymation I saw you start an anonymous blog for like resistance art I saw you kind of go in between despair and then like flailing grand projects <laughs> um I saw, you know, there were, you, you like one Halloween made this like intricate, like nature person mask monster costume. And I don't know, like what, how did you climb your way 
out? Was it through community? Was it through work? Like what, what got you to the moment of like these paintbrushes do matter and I'm going to put bright colors on them? Like how did you get there? I think I just, you know, I think I felt there were so many other pressing demands. I'm like, should I be a doctor? Should I be a civil rights lawyer? Should I be a, <laughs> what the heck? And then I realized like, all I can do is, you know, write to my congressman vote and try to put, I decided after a lot of flailing and I think a lot of us in DC felt like we had to go to every single protest and it was becoming all consuming and it, it can wear on the psyche to spend all your time fretting. So I think I just got to the point where I was like, all right, all I can do is make art, try to uplift people, write to my congressman, donate art to the causes that I care about, but I can't solve all of the, I can't put out all the fires that are constantly burning around us. So I just had to return to my art. And in my next life, I would like to maybe be a civil rights lawyer and play the trumpet. <laughs> <laughs> or play the trumpet? Both. Okay. Yeah. That'd be like, a, you'd be useful at protests for sure. Exactly. <laughs> it would give me some relief Yeah. from long days at the office. Uh, well, I can't wait for that next reincarnation. So <laughs> look out. Thank you so much, Lulu and Kate, for sharing today. And uh, thank you, viewers, for those great questions. Um, you can still click that link in the chat to purchase your copy of Grand Isle. And as I mentioned, we'll have some, some signed copies while supplies last. So you don't want to wait too long on that. Uh, you can learn about other upcoming events in our children and teens department on our website, which is politics-pros.com. You just need to click on the children and teens tab and then click events and you'll see our calendar of upcoming events. We have so many good ones. Um, and as mentioned, you can also view past events on our YouTube channel. So thank you again, both of you. We hope to see you again soon, Kate. We hope to see you Thanks. again. What your next project brings. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Thanks very Thank much, so much, everybody. Thanks, Lily. All right. Bye, Bye. Thanks, all those friends.